Hi, my name is David Plyler, and I'm a music specialist at the Library of Congress. I'm pleased to be here today with members of the Flux Quartet, Tom Chu and Felix Fan, um, who are here to speak with me about one of the two programs that they're doing for concerts from the Library of Congress this year. Um, we're so pleased to have them. We wish we could have them in person, but uh, you know we're making do, and we're just so pleased that this actually came together. Um, uh, this concert will be broadcast for the first time on June 11th, um, and you can catch their earlier concert on June 10th, so you can get two days in a row of the Flux Quartet. Um, and you'll, my colleague Ann McLean uh, just interviewed Tom Chu and Oliver Lake, um, who is one of the featured artists on that first program, so be sure to catch that as well. Uh, so first of all, welcome. Thanks so much for being here with me today. Hello, David. Um, I thought we could just dive into it and just uh, talk a bit about these pieces that are on your second program. Um, I mean, you've got this huge range of uh, music that you're presenting across these two evenings, and they're, um, uh, you know, it, it's hard to, uh, it just shows the versatility of your playing, and so I'm a little bit, you know, just amazed to get these back to back and be able to witness the programs, um, you know, and, and listen to this music. And so um, some of the program, um, I thought we could just go um, in order of the program and speak about them uh, and some of the aspects of them that are interesting and that, that listeners might find um, interesting to hear about from the player's perspective. Uh, so the first work uh, that is on the program is Conlon Nancaro's Third String Quartet. And uh, I think it's a little bit uh, misleading because I, I don't think he finished or or the second quartet was lost or something. I'm not sure if it's- Yeah, it wasn't uh, finished, yeah. Mm -hmm. right, right. So yeah. it's really, it's kind of like his, his second and a half or, you know, but we right. call it the third quartet. And it's um, it dates from re rather late in his life. Uh, and I think 1987, if I'm not correct or uh, incorrect there. That's correct. Um, and um, just as a little bit of uh, background on Nankaro, he's probably best known for his player piano studies uh, that people um, that don't require a live uh, you know, manipulator to um, produce the music and they're written for player piano. And there's so many of these studies that allow him to accomplish all kinds of things with irrational rhythms and uh, tempo modifications that might boggle the mind of a normal human. Um, but he kind of approaches that sometimes with the string, you know, with his uh, acoustic music too. And so I'm, I'm wondering, first of all, just like your uh, impressions of playing this music and what what, what it's like to approach uh, uh, Nankara and just any thoughts you might have about it. Uh, Felix, you wanna? Uh, you want me to chime in on this one? Well, um, firstly, it's one of the, the class, if you wanna call it classics that, that has stayed in our repertoire for um, at least since I joined the quartet about 14 years ago. So there's not a whole lot of pieces we play consistently over, over the years. This is one of them. Um, the interesting aspect of this particular piece, it's, you know, the idea is kind of like the player piano idea. Um, but essentially there's three movements. There's a fast, faster first movement, slower second movement and faster last movement. All four of us are playing the same material, but at different rates of speed. So, for instance, um, you'll hear on the broadcast the opening. Um, I start the opening, and then uh, Max, our violist, comes in with the same material about maybe 30 seconds later. And then about 30 seconds after that, uh, I believe Conrad comes in. And then after that, Tom comes in as well, all playing the same material, uh, just different rates of speed. So if you, when, when one is listening to this piece, it's, it at times sounds like just a jumbled mess, um, but there is actual form to it, uh, which is really quite interesting. I don't know of an, another quartet that kind of has that idea, but every movement has that idea. So the second movement, the slow movement, Tom starts at the slowest rate. And then, um, I can't remember, that, is it, it then the Conrad? Con then Conrad, yeah. The, so at, at faster rate. So I come in last in the second movement. Um, I end, I come in last and then I end first um, because I'm playing that material uh, much faster than everybody else. Third, last movement is, is essentially the same as well. So um, it's interesting, yeah. It's, I remember one time 
I think my parents heard it and they had no idea what was going on. And, and, you know, <laughs> like if you listen to the piece and you don't know that that's what's happening, uh, it's better to know that that is happening uh, <laughs> for, for it to make any kind of sense whatsoever. <laughs> Just yeah. to add a little bit to what, what Felix was saying about these different rates, um, a, a, a kind of a, a subtitle to the piece, I think, is Canon's 3, 3 slash 4 slash 5 slash 6. And, and that's, um, that's literally referring to, I mean, it's not really numerically 3 to 4 to 5 to 6. It's, it's, it's just a, kind of like a, like a funny way for him to, uh, to have... Uh, described his compositional process. So what's actually happening, he, he sort of, ex he is using traditional notation, okay? But he kind of takes it to a different place. We, we see traditional bars, okay? But the number of notes in the bar is different. So as Felix is saying uh, in the first movement, he starts at the slowest rate. So he's playing the theme and there are only three notes in, in his bar. And then when we go to the viola line, he has four notes in, in the bar. And then then the then Conrad has five notes and I have six notes. So I literally am playing twice as fast as Felix. And therefore his material takes twice as long as, I, as my material. So. so when when you're playing through this music, and one of the things that I, and it, this kind of comes into play, I think with all of the different canons that that Nancaro does in, in in some of the studies as well, but like is as as you're learning it is are moments of convergence kind of the thing that allows you to, or are those like kind of the structural goal goalposts that you're looking at, or like how do you um, come to? I mean, as of course as you get to know it, then you just know it. But um, how do you uh, kind of corral that kind of uh, chaos in the sense that that comes into play? count <laughs> we just we got we have we just have to make sure we're counting at the same pulse otherwise otherwise it's impossible to stay together so um yeah, we always, and we always have this it's funny over the years that we've played this piece we always have this issue particularly in the third movement where i always feel like this there's a section that slows down and everybody else always feels like, no, we're not slowing down. I was like, we're definitely slowing down. So, <laughs> um, you know, there is there is quite a bit of variety in the actual material. Um, so what we do is the parts of the material that's that's either very loud or very orally distinct and memorable, we do sort of jot down. You know, we write down, you know, we sort of write down like a cue, you know, from, a, you know, from another player so that we have a pretty good idea of how we're relating to each other. That said, it's just kind of, um, it, it's just to keep us in the same, um, same ballpark because in the end, we want each of the lines to be, to be, to, you, know, you know, to be individual. So we don't want to perturb the the way we're, we're, you know, the individualistic, the individuality of each line. Yeah, and sometimes when the cues don't line up, when, when we get to a certain spot and the cue doesn't line up to where I am, that, then that, that's when the, the uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, presumably he could have easily written it a mechanistic sort of, uh, you know, iteration that he wanted this to be a live performance that so that there was that element of excitement and, and risk may be involved. I can imagine that that would be uh, an exciting change uh, for him as well as for the audience too, but. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, let's, let's maybe uh, move on to um, the next work on your program, which is by uh, a young composer named Elizabeth Ogonek. Am I pronouncing her name correctly? Oh, Ogonek. Ogonek, yeah. uh, Elizabeth Ogonek. Um, and it's a string quartet called Running It Still Life. And I, if I'm not mistaken, did you premiere this work or is this? Um... Um, yeah, we, we premiered this at the Santa Fe Chamber Music Festival years ago. Um, and she was kind enough to write the piece for us. Um, and um, yeah, since since that's happened, she's gone on to 
some pretty major commissions as well from major orchestras. So she's she's been she's doing well. So we were happy right, to right. have that piece so early because I don't know if we'd be able to get it from her now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what do, you, what do you think about the piece? Uh, what um, what made you think of it in in the context of this particular program? I think it's uh, fantastic. And again, this was my first chance to hear it. Go ahead, Tom. I, I think with the program, you know, we got this. Um, you know, we have we have this very you know we got this individually Nan Carroll, you know, uh, polyrhythmic piece, and then we have two pieces, um, uh, the Chelsea and the Oliveros, that are both. Um, in the in the drony and uh, minimal space, then you know. Then there's the Muhal Richard Abram violin piano piece that is virtuosic and like kind of like an intersection of European chromaticism and 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 you know and and, and free jazz or, or such, such a thing. So then Elizabeth's piece is a little bit, if we could say, kind of kind of the core sort of contemporary language. And it's, uh, I mean, to, to me, it's, it's, a, it's a piece that, that, that's a very kaleidoscopic, kaleidoscopic, it explores a lot of different colors. Um, it's got a form that like really feels like it's telling a story. So like, like you know, in that, in that sense, I, it was a good contrast to the rest of the program. Yeah, there's definitely a drama, like a some type of narrative to it that that's right. definitely comes through. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's um, I, I'm so glad that you pro uh, programmed it because I, it'll give me a chance to also get to know this composer better. And um, I think that that's one of the the great things about your group is that you advocate for music that uh, hasn't been heard much or is just getting uh, just just getting its first uh, chance to get heard, not just from um, you know young composers and and uh, emerging composers, but also from um, is, you know established names that might be writing a repertoire that is just not traditionally programmed unfortunately so i, I really appreciate uh, the breadth of the programming that you um, offer um then the next piece on the program uh is uh, is pauline oliveros's uh uh 70 chords for terry um presumably terry riley on his the on occasion of his birthday, I think, right? Yeah, and, that, uh, that's correct. I think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, could you tell me a bit more about this piece? Um, it, I think it has a subtitle, "A Meditation on String Theory." Oh, good. Um, yeah, this piece. I believe it was Conrad that um, that found this piece. Is that correct? Yes. Tom? Um, yes. And I didn't realize until we um, first rehearsed it. It came. Um, out of a book and in the book i think is just i don't know what she did tom do yeah you okay what so she did? i'll just help you out so it, yeah. it comes from a it, it was a it was a very large volume released in 2013 um and you know from oliveros it, it was the anthology of text scores right. and right. there are many many of them <laughs> yeah it was the book was about this thick <laughs> so, this is just two, this is just one page of of, of the thickness. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we should we should see whatever. What else, there's probably a lot of gems in that book as well. So uh, I don't know what else is in there. <laughs> yeah, and it's a it's a six minute piece, and each minute each of us has been given instructions to do something different um, sonically. Yeah, very minimal direction, directionally wise, but yeah. very specific in, in what she wanted. So, um. this explains why when I was looking for different um, versions of the piece online, I wasn't finding exactly what I was hearing in your version as oh, well. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking, wow, um, i just you know, but but then I started to realize that it was it was when I saw that the the text based component that that was uh, maybe something. One of the um one of the uh, situations that I face uh, not being, I, I mean, I work for the Library of Congress, but I'm not at the Library of Congress right now, so I don't have access to uh, the resources that I usually do uh, when I get to, um, you know, look at these programs. So this, it's always uh, kind of a, a, an adventure for me as well. Right. Uh, like yeah, I mean, also with, within a couple of times we played it last week in rehearsal and, and the, in the performance, it was, you wouldn't even know it was the same group playing this piece it's one of those pieces yeah. where you know anything yeah.
can happen depending on everybody's mood. Um, but the, you know, the thing is though, even though the surface is very different, I think the spirit of the piece is probably similar from performance to performance. Correct. And I think um, that that's what really comes through. Can you describe any of the, um, like give an example of, of some of the instruction that, that you're given, text instruction, I mean, offhand, or, or the ty or a type of instruction that you might receive? Like for instance, um, there could be, um, 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 you know, you're, you're playing one pitch and she just says, like experiment with the width of the vibrato gradually. And there could be another thing where, again, you're playing one pitch um, and it says, um, um, experiment with different bowing techniques that creates different, different timbres. So it's always, it's always just one parameter that's changing. Interesting. Have you played this work before? Or is this the first time that you've, you've brought it out? This this was my first time at least. Uh, this was this was our first time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I, I mean, I, I think it it adds something, but you're you're right that it does have a, a certain resonance with the Chelsea um, later in the program. Uh, we'll get to that uh, momentarily, but I mean, I think it's because of that um, sticking to the particular parameters of variations. Maybe that's maybe that's what helps to to do that. Um, the, the next piece of the program uh, by Muhal Richard Abrams uh, was a library commission, um, just like Oliver Lakes uh, was commissioned the other, from the McKim Fund uh, for violin and piano, um, also from the 90s. And um, this is a, a fascinating piece. Um, it was starting uh, with that low grumble in, a, in the piano. And mm -hmm. I'm curious, um, yeah, um, uh, what, you, what your experience has been like uh, playing it. It's, it was really uh, fun to get to know the piece. Yeah, this piece is like like uh, structurally, it's it's a very it's a very clear, shall we say, ABA. You know, like slow and then a very s small, explosive, fast section, and goes back to slow. Um, I, I, having having had the fortunes of working directly with Muhal and playing several of his other pieces, and also even playing with him, which was amazing, um, the piece definitely uh, should. Definitely uh, uh, shows like his his um, um, his 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 harmonic vocabulary, um, and, and it it is one that actually overlaps quite quite a bit with let's say European chromaticism. Mm -hmm. um, the the tricky part, what you were just saying, like the beginning of the piece is this low rumble <laughs> in the piano, and that's you know it's like uh, it it. it you know, we're in, in that in that register range. It's so hard to hear the pitch. So it was <laughs> it kind of threw an unexpected challenge my way. Um, but I think from a, a composition and aesthetic standpoint, Muha like very much like to explore extremes. You know, registrally, dynamically, um, tempo wise. <laughs> so it's it's a lot about that, and um, it kind of it really broadens just the expressive range. You know, I find, I find his music extremely expressive. And um, I think Corey and I, um, there are definitely, you know, there, there are things we have to really <laughs> drill and work on. Um, but um, yeah, in the end, you know, it's something, there, there's a lot of virtuosity there. There's a lot of, um, again, you know, ex exploration of extreme timbres. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the, the expressive descriptor of it, as well as like, you know, the, the different, um, uh, the, the different timbres that it gets from, um, you know, with the working in the piano too, uh, the stuff right. like that, that, that's really um, powerful. And, it, and as, you, as you say, just uh, uh, dramatically expressive. Um, maybe you could say, uh, just out of curiosity, a bit more about when you played with him what that experience was like um the the piece i did when, when i played with him was this trio and it was for piano violin and cello and he himself on piano and it, it, it had a structure it had three sections of music notated and then the, but then he just kind of treated those as 
music he's written down. And then when we wanted to sort of put the performance together, he's just like, okay, we will we'll start with an improv and then we'll do A. <laughs> and then then we'll add another improv. And then we'll do B. I mean, you know, we did this like about we did about four performances of this, and every every time the 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 map was different. But it was, I mean, then this kind of references back to the other Flux program. It's just I think one thing amazing about all these very very uh, eclectic and free minded jazz greats is they're they're just so um, embracing of this. Um, fluidity between written and created, you know, and improvised music. And also they have such, it's like when, regardless of what, where what your background in music, once, you know, once like we're working together, they have such like respect, mutual respect for, for the musicians. And it's such a, that's such a wonderful like feeling when we're working together. That sounds amazing. I, yeah. that, that's, it's such a good attitude, uh, one that more people need to adopt, I think. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, well, this brings us to our final work on the program, which is the second string quartet of Chelsea. Um, and he wrote this kind of in a, 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 he's a complicated figure. And I don't want to maybe delve too much into the stuff that's particularly complicated about it with, with respect to his, um, the tapings and the transcriptions and things like that that are a little bit controversial. but. Um, this was a time when he was producing some heavy duty chamber music. Uh, I think all three, uh, sec second, third and fourth quartets come from the early 60s, 61 through 63, I think, or around that time. Mm -hmm. And um, the, uh, the thing that I think um, if, if people are not familiar with Chelsea that they'll notice right away and kind of figure out right away is that there's a deep focus um, actually throughout all the, the movements on um, a single pitch or two and and uh, moving around uh, just these um, kind of a, just a very focused instead of like a giant constellation it's more like the the center of it and um you know I, i'm just the to me that that creates a um a performance challenge of just being able to um at least in my mind it's a ch it would be a challenge to really uh bring out those different uh details and and differences to to make that so in intriguing but the, your performance and the music itself is really um kind of astounding and and quite interesting to listen to um please tell us a, a bit about your experience playing this piece well um we had an opportunity uh a few years ago at the santa fe chairman music festival to play all of his quartets in one mm -hmm. evening which um in itself actually for me was quite an amazing feeling because they're all completely different. Yeah, you're, um, this particular quartet, um, I believe, um, came about as it was, it was an improvisatory work. And from that, it was written down onto, onto, onto paper. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're essentially playing an improvised work, even though we're, it's very specific um what we're playing um and you're right it's all centered on one pitch um you know there are things that that at least in my part and i'm sure in everybody else's part is a kind of unplayable um so in that sense we do have to improvise a little bit um but i remember the first time i played this piece years ago i i was just completely lost half the time <laughs> 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 you know, uh, rhythmically to try to stay stay in rhythm while doing about 10 different things at one time and trying to process that while you're going through it you, you really need to play this piece for me at least a couple times to really kind of um to be able to anticipate what's coming up um because if you if you're just trying to read it's not something you can just really sight read um um it's amazing. It's an amazing piece. Like all of his quartets are amazing, but this one in particular, um, also one of the aspects of this piece that um, doesn't exist in the other quartets is he he made this. Um, I mean, is it called a Chelsea mute? Um, it's a metallic metal one. Mute. 
Yeah, yeah. It's metallic mute. Metallic mute that gives off this buzzing kind of sound. That's um, yeah, it's quite interesting. But he he designed this thing so that you can kind of flip it onto the um, flip it onto the strings at certain 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 spots very easily, and then you have to take it off very quickly so you can flip it back off of, off of the strings. And sometimes if you get you know the the key for us is to get at least for me to kind of bend the metal a little bit so that you get maximum bounce off of the strings. Uh, because if it's too tight, it's not going to, it's going to have a different effect, but I guess each one of us have a different um, preference of how we want the mute to sound. So for me, I like it when it's bouncing around a lot going, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, it's cool. It's cool. <laughs> how do you feel about the mute, Tom? No, like like Felix said, um, it's 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 all individual and personal. But yeah, there's a little engineering and and the different instruments. I mean, the two violins are the same, but but the but when you go to the viola and cello, there's they're diff, different uh, thickness of strings, you know. And so, but actually, but the mute is the same size. It's not like it's not like Felix has a larger mute. <laughs> so, but 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 the cello strings are way thicker than violin strings. Um, just to add what Felix was saying about how the pieces, but yeah, it's correct. It's like, it's like a written down or it's like a notated improvisation. I think what's tricky is if you imagine, and I think, you know, a lot of this music just came from him sitting at the piano, right? And just like, like listening to like one sound for a long time. And if you imagine, um, like whether it's just one player or multiple players, let's say holding chords without counting but then but then the chords are different duration then there's somebody else that that's like writing it down and then on notation it's like oh that's off a triplet and then that's you know and then that's off a six tuplet da, 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 da. so there's a lot of like notated specificity and and so this is what felix is saying there's a lot of concentration but at the same time, we want we want to make a sound that's very seamless, you know. So so that I mean, to to be able to do both is 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 the challenge of the piece. You know, it, it makes me think a little bit of um, in a, a very different kind of music, but um, the specificity that you find in Ligeti is um, it has it. It's not to be complicated. It's not that's not the goal, but it's like it makes it so that you can play something that's complicated sound like it's supposed to sound and. To me, it right. sounds like with, with these things, it's the, the complicated factors. You know, we, I'm not looking at a score while I'm listening to it. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. see that that complexity. What I hear is, I mean, I, he, I hear complexity, but it's also kind of coming from some sort of simple place. Um, and so it's, um, it takes. I, I think that's one of the the kind of the paradoxes about this music is that for it to have that richness, it needs that. Um, so maybe that needs that complexity. I don't know. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I, I actually think the notational approach is, is effective because to have that precision on the page, then you are able to create these very subtle timbre changes. You know, if, if that wasn't on the page, then we might get lazy. Oh, let's just play that together. You know, <laughs> so. <laughs> well, um. I just want to ask if there's anything else that you'd like to add about the program. Um, but I'd also just want to thank you so much for, for being here and speaking with me about this. And I've learned a lot just uh, talking to you and I hope we have a chance to meet again in the future. But, uh, but, but before we go, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Well, um, I was really looking forward to playing at the Library of Congress, but <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately that didn't happen. So maybe one day. So <laughs> yeah, definitely. And um, always, uh, we we'd love to uh, have you come uh, visit anyway. If you're ever in town, just let us know because we'd love to show you uh, some of our holdings too. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, thank you so much to uh, both Tom and Felix for for joining us, and uh, everybody's going to, going to enjoy your concerts on uh, the, available starting on June 10th and June 11th. Uh, thanks again. Thank you. Thank David. you, David.